tardes, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por conectaros a esta sesión sobre cómo utilizar eh, el análisis de datos, el Big Data, para luchar contra la corrupción en la, en, en la contratación pública. Esta charla es parte de los talleres de trabajo que estamos realizando desde Fibio, Charla Prado, Innovación en la Contratación Pública. Y mañana, mañana miércoles, si lo estáis viendo en directo, tenemos una sesión por por la mañana donde hablaremos y estudiaremos los ejemplos, que, los casos que se están implantando en España para, para intentar luchar contra la corrupción usando datos. Hoy tenemos a Jali Fasecas, eh, eh, que es del proyecto DigiWiz, nos va a contar un poco eh, en qué consiste este proyecto europeo y, y eh, los datos para luchar en la Universidad de Cambridge y también en el en el, observ en el Observatorio contra la Corrupción de Bucarest. Thanks, Michal, and thanks for doing this, uh, this webinar. We hope to see you soon in Spain. We'll invite you in March for the big event we're organizing. Um, basically, just go ahead, uh, just go ahead and tell us more about what you're doing. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm uh, sharing my screen. Can you confirm that you see it properly and everything is all right? Okay, very good. So thank you very much for your kind words as, a, as an introduction. I didn't understand much of it, so I assume you have kind, uh, kind words. <laughs> yes, we just got the presenter mode in PowerPoint, so you guys in your notes, which maybe you don't mind, but maybe you... Ah, yeah. Well, I mean, that... How can I? Hmm. I uh, presenter mode. Yes. It's never has never done this before. Well, anyways, I will. You know what? I will try one more thing. Okay. And hopefully that will. Okay. You see now my presentation only, right? Yes. Very good. Okay. Perfect. Because, because I had two screens on that for the free. Okay. Very sorry for this uh, little intermezzo. Uh, I will start my presentation now, talk for roughly half an hour. And then you will have uh, uh, all of you will have a chance to ask questions and 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 uh, add uh, comments. But please, please uh, feel free to interrupt me if something is unclear. I, I understand we are talking through uh, the internet, so there should be there could be some problems with the connection, or my English might be too quick for you. So please, please stop me if, if anything is needed. So as uh, probably the introduction has said, I'm leading the project called Digivist, which is a new funded research project. I will talk about the details in a minute. And I'm also the director of the Government Transparency Institute, which is a, a little think tank in Budapest, in Hungary. Sorry, I have to stop you because something is, we are not live, it seems. No, no estamos viendo la oh, Ah, we are not seeing the slide. Well, why? Yeah? Ah, no, but I, I can see the screen fine. So, uh, Jonathan. No? No, we're having some problems. Uh, oh, sorry. To no see problem. Presentation. No problem. Sorry. Please, but... <laughs> Maybe it's my end. I usually don't use Chrome. So, can be a problem. Uh, okay. One second. Should I st try st uh, stop sharing and restart sharing again? Yeah, please, please try. But no, no. Okay. Hello. So you see me now. Very yes. good. You should. I start sharing my screen. 
Mm -hmm. Does this work now? You see my screen? No. Hmm. Mm. Uh, on my side, it says uh, it's shared. Yeah. Otra opción es mandar un enlace a todo el mundo y volver a empezar. Pero ahí lo oís en, en, en directo. Eh. Ah, solo tenemos aquí en imagen. Cuando él, él habla. Pero yo puedo compartir pantalla y poner la presentación. Ya está. Bueno, espérate. La pantalla de Mejane. Lo que hay que hacer es poner la presentación. Hmm. Pero aquí no... Eh, eh, Mihaly, eh... Yes? No, no, uh, can you uh, try to share now your... Uh, I think we can see your screen. Uh, right now, uh, the presentation is not uh, open, right? It's not. Uh... Okay, I can uh, share my screen now. Uh... Okay, it's already fixed. It works now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And do you see my uh, first slide now? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, we, we, have had, <laughs> we have a little bit of delay, but the, uh, everything seems right now perfect. Okay, very good. Perdonar todos por el jaleo. Adelante, go ahead, please. Now it's very super good, fine. Very good. Great. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, start my presentation again from scratch. So basically, I'm running the DigiVist project at the University of Cambridge, which is an EU-funded research project looking at public procurement, uh, data and corruption risk indicators and anti-corruption uh, tools. And I'm also director of the Government Transparency Institute, which is a small think tank in Budapest, Hungary. And we work on big data uh, methods and, and uh, approaches for, for measuring government performance. Today I'm going to talk roughly half an hour and then you, each of you will have a chance of asking questions and adding comments. I have two main points. The first one is on, on corruption measurement, the data and indicators uh, we need uh, for this kind of quantitative measurement of corruption risks. And the second point uh, is about, okay, what can we do with uh, these data and indicators once they are in place? What are the effective solutions uh, which uh, can build on, on, uh, on the, the data and indicators I'm proposing? And what evidence do we have about these uh, interventions? So let's move on to the first uh, part, which is about data. So the DigiVis project looks at uh, contract level public procurement data. I understand most of you are familiar with this kind of data. So it is data very uh, fine grained, very uh, high level of detail um, coming from public announcements of call for tenders, contract award announcements, modification announcements, things like that. But the point is that we have millions of tenders from all around Europe. And for each tender we have uh, a great number of variables typically, so something like two, three hundred variables describing the process itself. Now, this is the heart of uh, what we are doing, part of our, our data and measurement uh, uh, template, but we also link this uh, procurement data to company data, so that's the, the supplier or, or bidder side, and we link it to company registry, company financials, or ownership and management information. And we also link the data to political office holders. So, for example, if you want to see if a supplier's uh, main owner is linked to the mayor of a particular town, then this uh, data template allows you to check for those obvious conflicts of interest. And finally, we also look at the public organizations, the public sector side, uh, treasury accounts in terms of uh, investments, uh, budget deficits, and uh, you know, wages paid. Okay, so this is what we are collecting, what we are trying to get. And we concentrate on the procurement data because I believe that is a, a central interest for, for uh, most of you. So the, the structured contract level data collected by DigiWist is uh, 
I believe it's it's an impressive uh, amount of data. However, one, while we were collecting this data, a number of issues arose, and I think it's useful to go over what kind of data there is in Europe, what we could collect and what we hope to collect. So, for example, if you push for reform in, in Spain for improving the data, publication and re reporting, then, then uh, you have clear pointers uh, as to where, where to push, which direction to push the Spanish data system. So I'm going to talk about data scope, so how many tenders there are and which kinds of tenders there are in our data sets, which ones are not observed. Um, now, scope of what we have uh, collected uh, in DigiWist uh, covers 32 European countries, so that is uh, the whole of the EU, uh, European Economic Area, plus a couple of additional countries uh, like Georgia. Uh, and this means that we collected data from national sources as well as DED, so the EU-wide public procurement data set. Um, um, for most countries, we have two sources, right? We have the national source as well as the EU-wide source, so we have uh, information on high value contracts as well as lower value contracts but it's not not true for every uh, single country the data uh, is is uh, great uh, in in its scope uh, it's about 12 million tenders it's growing by half, half a million tender per year uh, we are uh, releasing uh, uh, these data sets in in december and january country by country and uh, the place where you can access this information is open tender go to you but if you have any questions, just get in touch with me. So the data we have looked at has widely varying scope, also very different depth. So that means the, the amount of information, amount of um, uh, variables we know about each tender. Then quality differs. So it's one thing to say this data should be there, is mandatory. Quite another thing if, if the data is really filled in in the actual tender documentation or not. And finally, the availability of, of this data varies greatly. So in some cases, we know that there is good quality data, but it's just very hard to, to download it. Italy is, is a great example of that. So if you want to see a bit more details about why we advocate for, for these uh, dimensions to be uh, um, improved in European data, then, then here is the link. And I believe the presentation will be shared throughout. Okay, so the next slide where we get into details is uh, about data scope, what we managed to uh, collect. So this is the number of tenders processed by DigiVis per country, and that's national data as well as the EU-wide dead data combined for all these countries. I think uh, the, the kind of ranking, even though it's not a ranking, but the distribution is very surprising. So. Uh, Poland and France being big countries have each uh, over 3 million tenders. And then there is Portugal, which is one of uh, the small countries in the EU. It has uh, 1 million uh, tenders published in our database. And then Spain is the, is the fourth biggest country. But for example, if you look at Germany, it publishes something like third of what Portugal is, is publishing. Now, uh, what are the reasons behind this? widely varying amount of the tenders, number of tenders, the scope of our data. There are multiple reasons for that, but one major reason is national publication thresholds, so contract value thresholds about which contracts have to be uh, publicized, uh, contracts have to be publicly announced. Those thresholds vary greatly, and this is just one example for services contracts uh, for central uh, government bodies across Europe. And you can see on the right-hand side that there are some countries such as Germany and Netherlands, which only apply the EU-wide uh, EU uh, uh, reporting thresholds, the TED uh, thresholds mandated by the EU directives. And then if you go to the left, like Portugal, Cyprus, Armenia, Georgia, these countries have very, very low threshold. So we have a close to complete picture of what purchasing, government purchasing is going on. Uh, without going too much into detail, I wanted to highlight uh, one aspect, which is the persistent lack of uh, organization IDs in most countries in Europe. 
Now, organizational IDs are very important because most of the things we are interested are linked to actors, and there are two actors in procurement, buyers and suppliers. So identifying them is key because, say, you want to calculate market shares, you want to track uh, behavior, performance over time, or you really only just want to have a full picture of what a particular buyer is doing. For all of these very basic things, you need an ID. And you need an ID because just by relying on the, the names of organizations is not good enough because uh, people uh, name organizations in many different ways. Uh, my, one of my favorite examples is the University of Bologna, which is arguably one buyer in Italy. However, it appears in at least 10 different uh, ways in, in the database. So univ.bologna, Bologna University, then the Italian variant of all this. So basically, it's very hard to identify all the contracts belonging to the University of Bologna unless we have organizational IDs. So, uh, as, a, as a result, DigiVist is, is attaching organizational IDs, matching company tax IDs and buyer IDs for, to, to procurement tenders in countries where there are no, no IDs. Spain is a one particular example where only supplier IDs are published and mandatory to publish, but buyers uh, don't have a, a unique ID uh, published in, in the public procurement announcements. Now, moving on to data quality, and what you see here is the average share of missing information among uh, 30 mandatory fields, so very, very basic fields you can think of, like contract value in a contract award announcement, name of the winning company in a contract award announcement, or the submission deadline in a call for tender, so really basic things. Uh, so we looked at these uh, essential 13 fields and we calculated on average per country in this five-year period how much of this, what proportion of these fields are missing, meaning completely empty. And what is surprising is that the best governed countries in Europe, such as Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, they have the highest uh, share of, of missing information, roughly one-third of, of these fields are missing, but even the EU average is well above fifteen uh, percent, meaning that uh, you are likely to get fifteen uh, percent of these basic fields missing if you open up uh, the, the average typical uh, announcement in Europe. <clears throat> uh, finally, about data is uh, data uh, availability and machine readability. So basically, we expect data to to be downloadable or, or an API, an application programming interface, where, where you can get the data without any hiccup, without any uh, complication. However, only very few countries do this. The UK, Poland, and Belgium. Most countries publish uh, procurement data in semi-machine readable, uh, semi-structured structured format such as a, an HTML page, which makes it very hard to reverse engineer the, the underlying database. This is what DigiVis has been doing for over two years now. Uh, before I move on to measuring corruption, is there any question about these, or could you hear me well enough? It's all fine. I, I have a couple of co uh, small questions. Um, one is about um, the formats, the data formats. Mm -hmm. You're going to start producing all this information and you work with all this internally. Mm -hmm. So are you using or are you planning to use like the open contracting data standard or do you, do you see moving yourselves to that or? Yes, it's a very good question. So we publish data in multiple formats. One of, the, one of these formats is OCDS. So you get standard okay. version 1.1 OCDS uh, format. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, so that's so that's good for those of you who are more of a programmer uh, IT background. For those of you who are more used to traditional statistical analysis, so you know, roughly speaking, uh, two-dimensional tables with observations in rows and variables in the columns, we also publish uh, something we call flat CSV outputs. So that, that is... Mm -hmm. that is statisticians, but uh, that is also accept, uh, available. And finally, the third uh, way of publishing information is um, 
uh, when uh, when you talk about our um, watchdog portals, which allow you to zoom in on a set of uh, organizations or vendors, so you can download your um, uh, hit list or your search results uh, directly from the portal. Very good. Great. And my second question about this part of the presentation would be, I mean, uh, to get the information from Spain, for example, what you had to do was, did you scrape the website, the, the central government website? And um, and I guess you are only doing it at the national level, right? Because one of the issues that we have in Spain is that the, the data is very fragmented. Or each city may have their own portal and not always they share it with the, with the national level Yes, yeah. we went to, very, to very, gather all this data. Exactly, exactly. So our resources allowed us to uh, scrape the national portals. So for Spain, we have the national portal, but not not the the subnational, regional, or municipalities. So that's why Spain has a lot fewer publications that we than we hoped for. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perfect. Yeah, it's fine with us. So if you want to continue to the second part, that's great. Exactly. Now I'm moving on to part two, which is about measuring uh, corruption. Uh, without getting too much into definition or problems, uh, I just want to put uh, out, uh, put up our definition, which is based on theory as well as uh, nicely uh, uh, corresponding to what practitioners understand as corruption in this field. And finally, this is also a useful definition because it directly will lead into our measurement concept. Now, the, this definition rests on two pillars. So we talk about corruption in public procurement when there was a deliberate act of avoiding competition, unjustified sole sourcing or direct contract award. And this deliberate uh, limitation on competition has been used for favoring a certain bidder, right? So these are the two components. You restrict competition and you use this for uh, basically getting the contract to your friends, their cronies and acquaintances. Now, this is very different from criminal law concepts of corruption. It often is different from fraud, right? This, this is a EU-wide used, uh, auditors use uh, these concepts. But it is very nicely working with the data and, and uh, our more broader civil society focus where people can, can work with this definition. Now, how does this definition translate into data points and actions and, and behavior in our data set? The first aspect of this definition is that any corrupt group would target a contract. It would want to overprice a contract. It would want to bias uh, the tendering uh, process. It would want to uh, assure that the quality is lower than what the market would be able to deliver. So that is always the, the, at the heart of corruption. Then there would be two actors, both of which are necessary to participate in a corrupt deal, so the public, the private side. And because we are talking about an informal relationship, an informal contract uh, superimposed, overwriting uh, a formal contract, we also need a personal or particularistic tie or relationship. Now, what is really nice about these four components, very simple components on corruption in public procurement, is that we can match corruption risk indicators to each of these aspects, each of these elements. So you can have tendering risk indicators. I think that uh, that's what uh, some people in Spain have started to do, look at uh, the shortcomings, uh, biases in the tendering process, but one can also define supplier risk indicators such as tax haven registration. One can look at uh, the contracting body risk indicators such as high levels of high degrees of politicization of a public organization. And finally, one can track political connections, so outright conflict of interest or some more deliberately, more elaborately hidden uh, personal connections, okay? So it's really nice. We have four components. For each of these, we can have indicators. I will give you examples in a minute. And you can use these for risk assessment separately or also in conjunction, so together. And this is where we start being very excited because triangulating different red flags, different risk indicators, really give us a, uh, gives us a lot stronger uh, trust in our uh, risk assessment methodology. 
So two examples uh, I chosen because uh, these are fairly straightforward to to interpret and, and widely, more or less widely available data. So I will give you one example of a tendering risk indicator, which will be single bidding on competitive markets. And I will give another example of supplier risk indicators, which is political campaign donations. I think it nicely, nicely talks to the Spanish context as well. So modeling corrupt contracting and in particular single bidding. One frequently quoted scheme is where the advertisement period is very tight so it's very hard to put together sensible bids and then as a result there is only one company which can bid there we can assume that this company had been warned before the official publication has been given some relevant information about, about the bid so that it can really prepare the head of competitors right so this is a distribution from portugal looking at awarded contracts according to their uh, ad, ad, actual uh, advertisement periods. We have a spike at 40 and 50 days. These are the legal minimum advertisement periods. And then there are these tight deadlines, right? And then the, the, the model in question and also the measurement question becomes, what is tight? Is it five days? Is it 20? Is it 30, right? That will obviously depend on the market, depend on the country, contract value, right? So we, we cannot uh, you know, arbitrarily define what is tight, right? We have to look at the data. We have to have some statistical means for identifying these cut points below which or above which we talk about high degrees of risk. So what we did here, we built an econometric model which uh, predicts uh, single bidding on competitive markets, so the likelihood of a one bit submitted uh, on an uh, open and then you know, on, on paper open and competitive uh, tender. And then we see, for example, that uh, advertisement periods shorter than 30 days uh, are associated with 14% uh, uh, higher single bidding than the benchmark 48 plus days. So that's the, you know, the, the legally mandated uh, uh, lengthy advertisement period. Okay, so basically we brought together two aspects of tendering. One is a tight deadline, the one is single bidding. And we, we define the cut point and together these two indicators and, and the, the threshold could give us a stronger indication of a collusive uh, corrupt uh, scheme, right? It's not proof of corruption, but the two indicators together gives you some confidence in, 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 a, in a risky uh, scenario, risky uh, setup and behavior. Uh, single bidding contracts are also the most expensive contracts, so that you know, goes, goes one step further. Uh, it's a third variable to our scheme of, of uh, measuring risks. Uh, these bars represent the average discounts given by companies in Europe uh, according to the number of bids submits and submitted. And then you see that the discounts are lowest in, in a single bidder contracts. Now moving on. To the second indicator, second example, this is a supplier risk indicator, which is campaign donations. There have been countless examples, I believe, from Spain, but also Italy or Brazil and other countries where companies campaign donations effectively gave them favored access to government contracts and, and politicians. This is a, just one example of, of this. This is looking at US uh, federal contractors corruption risks in their uh, tenders and the amount of uh, political party donations they, they have given. And you see on the graph on the bottom right hand side that after uh, giving a certain you know, modest amount, uh, basically the relationship is linear. So more you give, more risky your contact contracts behind come, right? So that's the idea of triangulating, right? Donations might be or might not be risky, but if they are coupled with uh, tendering risks, then our confidence of these indicators signaling uh, political favoritism, high level corruption greatly increases. <clears throat> okay, I will move on to what we can do with this data unless there are questions about uh, uh, measurement. Are there any questions? Are you still there? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's fine. You can continue. Okay, very good. So moving on to the third final part, 
which is about effective anti-collapsion interventions using these data and indicators. Uh, there are a great number of things one can do with these uh, uh, data sets and indicators. The most basic thing of these is informing public opinion, uh, really just uh, feeding citizens, journalists, NGOs with relevant information about what's going on in procurement markets. Seems very basic, but it can be very powerful. Now, you can do something slightly more complicated. You can track changes over time. You can see if uh, corruption risk increased or decreased after governments uh, changed. Then you can do even more complicated things. You can code compliance checks, automated compliance checks. You can look at gaming or and publication thresholds. You can look at uh, basic compliance with uh, time limits or some you know, certificates, you know, basic things, but still these are improvements over auditors randomly checking a small sample of vendors. The next one you can give, be, do something which is a lot more fancy, predictive analytics, risk-based supporting risk-based audit. I will give you an example of the, all of these in a bit. And finally you can look at more of a researchy policy uh, uh, assessment kind of uh, activity, looking at uh, regulatory enforcement interventions impact. Right. So this finally we are not in the darkness of, of you know how to improve our laws, but we can change things, check impact, you know, change again. So look at uh, uh, an example which uh, is very recent, uh, two months ago in Estonia, just before the local elections in Estonia, the Ministry of Justice published a municipal ranking of corruption risks based on DGV's data. Nothing computationally, nothing fancy, just taking averages uh, for these municipalities. Still, it hit the headlines and I believe it influenced uh, people's decisions about, uh, about uh, which you know, whether you choose incumbents or, or contestant uh, local parties. You can go a little bit more uh, fancy with informing uh, public. Uh, and these, these are Vajdo portals. I believe there is one in development in Spain and there are a great number of Uh, uh, for a minute yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so if you can go back and, and now we can see your screen I think it's um, you stop you stop sharing maybe okay so you didn't hear me at the budget portals right that's where I should re resume we lost at the beginning we lost you at the beginning of the of the slide okay so I'm, I was talking about and we cannot, see the, we cannot see the presentation now okay should I try? I can share it again. You see it now? No. Presentation now? No. Very strange. I can uh, stop. Uh, if you can stop sharing and try sharing again, but I think the, the internet connection went off for a few seconds. Okay. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Do you see my screen? It's weird because no, we are not see you either. Yeah. So, uh, okay, maybe. Wait, maybe you can close close the hangout and try again, or what? Do yeah, you? because no? we can. No, we cannot see your video now. Okay, I can hang up and hang uh, up and hang again. Yeah, try try that. Yeah. Eh, bueno, perdona por los problemas técnicos, cosas de cosas de internet. Eh, eh, si tenéis dudas, eh, podéis mandarlas ahora si estáis viendo esto en directo. Grabado, podéis eh, podéis pasaros por las páginas del Media Lab y preguntar cualquier cosa. Eh, hemos vuelto a Mihaly. Mihaly, you are back again. We can see you perfectly. Good. I share my screen.
Do you see my screen now? Yes. Very Perfect. Good. So I'm going back to the DigiVist watchdog portals. I was saying that uh, if the time allows and there is interest, I can click you around a bit. But basically, our standard uh, watchdog portal will be deployed in every uh, European country where we have data. And these portals will allow for doing some basic market analytics, looking at transparency scores, looking at indicators of administrative capacity, and finally, looking at corruption risks. This will be a very flexible tool allowing for ranking and scoring suppliers as well as buyers, but also uh, drilling deep into different markets and down to the tender level. So this, this is uh, uh, about informing public uh, opinion with this kind of data. Then one can look at uh, quality of governance or corruption risks uh, over time. And this is a particularly interesting figure, which is, uh, uh, has underpinned the, the cohesion report recently published uh, by the European Commission looking at the pre-financial crisis with the most recent uh, data, so the changes between pre-financial crisis and more recent uh, uh, data. Uh, you know, red, red ones are those where governance quality decreased and then green ones where increased. It's very a diverse picture, very interesting. I wish we had more time to discuss it, but maybe we can return later. Spain is particularly interesting. Now, the third point I mentioned was automated compliance checks. So one thing we have done, and this is a Polish example now, is that we looked at the, the estimated value threshold, and we looked at whether tenders are on the TED portal or the national portal, and whether there are any tenders placed on the national portal which actually should be on TED. And these are the dark uh, green uh, bars to the right from the zero. So those are which are above the threshold, but they are uh, from the national database and we cannot find their equivalent on, on the TED database. So these are outright breaking the law, right? But you know, if you don't think that someone will watch, uh, you can just break the law without uh, thinking that you, that you will be caught, right? Now you can do one more thing with this data is that let's look at the thresholds and let's see if there is uh, some more sophisticated gaming around this threshold. So these are, Again, Polish examples, and you see uh, a couple of things on these figures. The first thing is that the big spike right under the threshold. The second thing that you can observe is that there is a big missing just above the threshold. So it really feels like contracts from just above the threshold have been placed just under, right? So if the threshold wouldn't cut this distribution, you would have a, a downward sloping uh, distribution of contracts without uh, any breaks. And finally, the third thing you can observe on these figures is that as the threshold got updated with inflation, so from 2010-11 to 2012-13, the spike moved as well. So we moved from 180 to 200,000 euros. So it's really funny how regulation uh, moves contract values and, and behavior, right? So with this kind of data, you can you know, check you know, each of those contracts which are just under the threshold, like looking like manipulated contracts or contract slicing, and you can, you can uh, you know, do the right action if, if this was really wrongdoing. The final question we posed about uh, this threshold, whether thresholds matter. And what we looked at is the share of single bidding in, in Poland just uh, below and just above the threshold. As you can see, contracts just above the threshold have lower single bidding shares. So it really looks like placing a tender on, on TED uh, uh, decreases uh, single bidding, so increases uh, bidder number. So it looks like there is, there is some, some effect here, even though uh, it's really, really just a suggestion. Next point, next application or anti-corruption tool is that you can use this data for mapping corruption risks and you can drive your audit or, or, or um, anti-corruption interventions using this data. And that's very important because auditors or, or courts tend to focus on individual cases. 
However, if you look at the full web, if this is a particular Latin American country's full web of contracting activities, then you can see that the uh, risks can uh, uh, risks are likely to cluster. So the large dots, which mean they are high risk uh, uh, buyers or suppliers. So these large dots often tend to be clustered, tend to be close to each other, meaning they they contract with each other or they contract with each other's neighbors. So that is just to say that well, you know, you can target individual companies, but actually corruption risks uh, cluster together, say, on a market or regional level. So in 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 this case you just realize then in, in a certain uh, degree of corruption or systemic corruption calls for a more uh, large-scale intervention rather than you know, picking individual companies and punishing them from wrongdoing. And yes, I will jump over the final one because probably it's less interesting. Okay, that was my, my quick presentation. Looking forward to questions and happy to share further insights. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. One second. Um, yes, well, we have a couple of questions. Uh, first, for example, about the actual scope of DigiWiz. Uh -huh. I mean, are you in actually implementing some of these indicators? And um, for example, uh, contract slicing, like in order to avoid threshold, you split the contract in two or three parts. Mm -hmm. So, are you planning to actually try to detect that in the European data? Yes, it's an important question. So, this was only an example we have done for one particular country. We don't deploy these indicators as default DigiList indicators of, of contract slicing in the the watchdog portals. We have the algorithms for, for Poland, which work for other countries as well. And we hope to to expand our analysis to all the other countries where we can do this analysis, such as Spain. But it's not part of our standard indicators. It's more like a tailored, tailored analysis. So you're part of DigiWist as part of as your ongoing work? Going further. We're planning to do it going further, DigiWist, yes. Okay, that's fantastic. And also, you mentioned clustering. Uh, you showed that network of uh, of relations of how the risk group together. Useful, or are you planning to try to detect, for example, cartels, like when three companies kind of get all the contracts in a particular sector for a particular service? Do you do uh, you plan to? We're do not that? going to look at cartels or collusion among uh, suppliers or collusion among bidders. That's uh, oh. that's. Uh, something we do research on so we have done uh, in sweden hungary and uh, peru as well we have done uh, collusion analysis and uh, that can be done with the research with the data and, uh, we have but it's not again not part of the standard digivist uh, indicators so then standard indicators of digivist are basic market analytics transparency administrative capacity and corruption risks okay so Great. And, um, and my last question is, you mentioned, um, I mean, clearly there's so many things to, to check and so many indicators to try to implement. And, and the, the last one that was very interesting was that you mentioned donations to company, uh, to com uh, sorry, to, um, from companies to political parties, sorry. Spain, we have uh, quite a few scandals that are related to or potential scandals that are related to companies uh, donating money. Information is very hard, at least in Spain. I, I know that the situation in the States is very different. So is there, I, I really don't know, is there any country in Europe where, well, I guess the Eastern, Eastern Europe is more common. Which countries are publishing this information? Like yes, exactly. Some, some Eastern European European countries, such as the Czech Republic, have uh, fairly good quality donations data. I mean, I, I understand that even in the best case scenario, we, we touch the tip of the iceberg, but still good enough data to, to work with. Yes, I mentioned the US. And it's really only a handful of countries. This is more of an inspirational example where 
let's push for transparency on these uh, donations because they matter a lot. And if they are hidden, they, they mm. can drive contracting without us realizing it. Yeah. Yeah, I heard, for example, the case of Georgia where they revamped the whole public procurement process and they started publishing and donations to parties. And uh, well, we were always very jealous here yeah. in Spain because downloading the company register in Spain, for example, is not possible in bulk. But donations to parties, so yeah, I mean, we are always very excited to hear about this. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I just wanted to put my message here that we really. Yes, I mean, I think the right the, the right approach here is that let's not go for per perfection, right? I mean, there are uh, great examples. We covered something like 35, 40 indicators on really various different types. For each country, you can implement what you can implement right away. So I, I believe Spain has good enough data for a great number of things, but you know, not for uh, political party donations or not for indicators on, on company registration because the data is not available. So I think it's very important to start with what you can do right away with the data available currently and push for, you know, like use the inspirational examples to, to push for, uh, you know, more data be released and more data being captured by governments. Yeah, no, and, I, and from CBO, we, we've been pushing a lot this year to change the law, more information published. Um, we were quite successful in, in changing the law that got approved now, it's going to be enacted in March. Just to get more information, not only about the tendering, but also about the whole procurement process. So if, if for the Spanish people watching this, if they want to know more, they can contact CBO or the Media Lab groups uh, we are organizing that this new law will have and um great yeah and uh, i think we don't have any wins. so i just wanted to thank you Michali, for your time and your presentation which was really really interesting and the work of all this it was really, really helpful to to get a much clearer view of of how to go about this and if you are watching this live uh, uh and uh, thank you, Michal. And uh, wait, one question. <laughs> ah, yes, we have a question from Eva. We have a question from our journalist. Uh, you mentioned that it's very difficult to explain all these things to normal people. So, how do you think the administration should proceed to try to translate all these complex concepts to to, to society mm. practice? This is what I, I think yeah, is yeah. I think there are two layers to this um, to this question. First one is, I think some of the complexity is deliberately created so that uh, it's harder to understand for people, hence harder to control government. So, one one obvious thing governments, sincere and honest governments, can do is simplification. Right? Really, we don't need thirty five different standard forms. Right, you know, five or three may be enough, right? And that's already, you know, a lot easier to understand. We don't need 20 different definitions for contract value, right? One is enough. People understand it, lawmakers understand it. You know, let's not overcomplicate things. So that's, I think, one big answer. A second one, given our complexity, we can do a lot better job in explaining things to people. And that's one of the aspirations of Digitist, right? So instead of doing uh, using very complicated legal terms and you know being very precise, very complicated, try to go to the basics. Try to uh, uh, you know highlight the most important facts, interpret them, and make them actionable. So really, indicators, standard definitions, easy to understand definitions. I think. Uh, this, this is one one aspiration we all can, you know, CV or in others in Spain can contribute to to make it more understandable for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, as you said, we are trying to work on that also, and we encourage journalists to try to learn more about public procurement so they can explain what's going on. And we also have a session for that in January. For the, no, sorry, in February. Um, yeah, so. Thanks a lot, Michali, and thanks for the presentation. We at CBO, we are big fans of all, all the work you're doing, um, and you and DigiWist, and, and hopefully we'll see you in Madrid soon, in, in March. 
great and a little advertisement. So in this in um, nice. January we have uh, a workshop in Barcelona. It's not uh, uh, Madrid. It's the eighth and ninth <laughs> of 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 January. It's jointly organized with Xnet, uh, uh, a local NGO. So I, I will send, send on, mm -hmm. on the invitation. So we talk about DigiVista, and I think that would be a great opportunity to meet some of you and talk about potential collaborations. Sounds very good. If you send us a, an email with information, we'll, we'll share it in our social network. So everybody watching and following us. Great. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Bye. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye.